our episodes in the on our YouTube channel, Let's Talk Forensic Psychology, we wanted to comment on things as they were happening or sort of current national or international events from a forensic psychology sort of focus to try and help us think about what's happening and why, why people might be responding the way they are, but also to broaden our thinking and um, talk a bit more about what's going on and why it might be happening. Um, so we're going to talk the call these particular episodes Let's Talk Forensic Psychology today. So we were thinking a bit about what's been happening uh, around the world in the context of this pandemic that's still going on. And we were thinking a bit about some of the uh, riots that were going on. And so people have got lots of different views of why this might be happening. And Emily was talking about some um, a view about you know, the context of the pandemic. Yeah, I was yeah, reading an article about how actually we could, if we look back at um, history, then perhaps we could have predicted that people may riot, maybe not to the, to the level that we have seen recently, but actually that when we think about the, the, um, the process of being in lockdown, if we think about that in relation to our ancestors and how we had to learn to survive, so whilst we're not fighting lions anymore, actually like the process of being in a lockdown and like being not able to go out and not able to socialise, our survival needs are triggered and actually we need some way to let that out. Um, and this group mentality happens, We the civil unrest, we like to um, kind of find a way as fight or flight kicks in and we need to find a way to survive. And, and um, I read an article earlier, it was on, in The Guardian actually, about how um, during the Ebola virus and also with SARS, there were some minor riots. Um, and actually maybe we could have used that to think about, we can well, we could structure our thinking and thinking about today and what's happening in the world and the lockdown and taking it all into account. If you think about the pressure that builds up or the fear and anxiety that people have around at this time, we were talking about the uh, effect trauma has on people and, and the response we can suddenly have to feeling high levels of helplessness, fear, distress, that some people turn to this idea of fight or flight and some people will be thinking, you know, I need to fight my way out of this. I need to be able to protect yeah. myself. This is going to be my strategy to feeling fear. Absolutely. And I think when our sort of threat systems are, are put up like that, when we're feeling very anxious, we're not sure what the enemy is or where the enemy is. And we've had a long period now of being in lockdown and 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 of heightened sensitivity to this. And so we're all under threat. We're sort of at bubbling point a lot of the time anyway. So one thing sort of inciting a step higher could well bring this out. And I think what we see sometimes in riots is that people who wouldn't generally think of themselves as being criminals get drawn into to group, group thoughts. And so they might be drawn in by um, comments that are made on social media, for instance, about we need to do this. And if we get drawn into thinking we're part of that group and we identify with that group, we have to stay in with them. We have to go along with their norms. So people might get into doing things like looting or um, pulling down statues or doing things that they wouldn't normally, if you ask them, a month before, would you ever think of doing that? They'd say, no, I wouldn't dream of it. But they actually end up being drawn into things by the, um, the sort of being part of that group, because when we know we're under threat, we need to be part of a social group. Mm. I, was, I was thinking that um, social psychology is a lot to offer around that theme, actually, Jerry, around social identity um, and how people, like you were saying, might be in that group and might align themselves with being part of that group. And um, however, once the out group starts threatening their sense of identity, they then mobilize and do things that they might not necessarily want to do. And I was thinking about the importance of actually our sense of belonging um, and our sense of identity and who we are and how that shapes how we are. So I guess we might not, you know, we might not really do that ordinarily, but in that group and in that situation, um, it becomes much more likely. And thinking about the wider context then about what you were saying, Laura and Emily, around the pandemic, and then I guess the boundaries around and what we would normally do are, are weakened, I guess, and we might have a, a more of a threat response. It's really interesting if you think about rights and what might make people be violent, you know, in this sort of way. Do you think that some of those key motivations, feeling that injustice, feeling inequality, whether it's on the street or if you take that into a prison, if you look at some of those, a lot of those riots are based in injustice, inequality. 
some of the major riots in prisons and one of the most sort of famous ones people will have heard of is the Strangeways riots. People felt that they weren't being treated well. Um, and I guess that people often feel like that in prison and to some extent they are and to some extent they're not. But I think it gets to a tipping point and that seemed to be what happened in Strangeways. People felt that they were being oppressed or not treated well and, and that there's a big gap between the haves and the have-nots. And that often does then again incite that to to take in that next step to do something about it. I was going to say, as psychologists, there is a role that a lot of prison psychologists take on, which is that negotiator training, mm -hmm. whereby they would go and consult on, on you know, rights that happen if people are up on the roofs or they're rioting in the prison. Psychology can play a really important role in helping the team and working with the, um, you know, the officers and the governors and, you know, having a shared responsibility about what's happening in the prison. Mm -hmm. I do remember one evening um, towards the end of a day, a time when there'd been some sort of unrest within the prison. Um, and there was a group of um, residents that were waiting to go somewhere. So they were in a, a fairly sort of confined corridor waiting to go somewhere. And an officer was saying they couldn't go for some reason. Um, but I suddenly felt it tip. I suddenly felt the tension and I felt that it could very easily tip into something very unpleasant. Um, and it was very much a matter of trying to identify with one of the people and get him on side so that it didn't become a group thing. And I could, that was the closest I felt to thinking how quickly you could lose a wing, literally, because you only, there was about eight or 10 people there together. But if they'd all turned in that way, they could have easily incited other people that were around the periphery. Um, and you could really feel the tension building with people, one person saying this isn't fair, and another person, yeah, actually, this isn't fair. And very quickly, it felt very contagious, and it felt very easily to be drawn into what they were saying as well as being unfair, because on some levels, it wasn't fair. You know, they wanted to do something they would normally do. So I um, certainly felt that, you know, that was the closest I felt to thinking, actually, this could just go now. Mm -hmm. um, and you realised how quickly and easily that could go. And once they were separated, it was almost divide and conquer. Once they sort of separated away a bit, they realised, almost sort of gave their head a shake and realised it was getting out of hand. And this is the idea about environmental psychology. I mean, if people are interested in reading about it, if you had a look at some of those theories around forcing change, I do, you know, if you think about what's going on now or, or in prisons, you know, there's this idea that perhaps behaving in a certain way or being violent can, can sort of force change. And I wonder if that also straddles into other areas of offending. I was thinking of the idea of feeling heard. And I guess when people don't feel heard, actually what you were saying, Laura, for such a long time that they feel that that's their only choice to, to be able to be heard. So I know slightly different to some of the offences, actually, but, you know, in terms of riots and, you know, and then things that might have happened around the, the BLM movement or things that might have been happening with the riots that have happened here in the UK, you know, that notion of not feeling heard um, and the, the lengths that people might go to, to enable that or to have that voice heard. Mm. I was looking at um, some cyber psychologists and network researchers and what they were saying about the role that social media has. I know it's slightly different coming away from prison riots, but actually um, there's a the theory that if you're seeing if you're seeing online and on the network loads of people getting involved in in an activity if there's a risk in any way you, you're seeing loads of people do it you think well it doesn't really matter if I get involved even if it's bad because actually I, I'll get you know I'll be hidden away there's so many people doing it so you're more likely to get involved whereas actually if you went to that event in real life you might think you might think twice about it so actually social media and the internet has a way of lowering our risk of understanding the, the consequences and punishments of people's behaviours. Mm. Mm. I think that's so important, that anonymity that we think we have mm. by being on the internet. Um, yeah. And so I don't think you would never dream of walking up to say those things to people, whereas you think people think that it's okay to say it yeah. and to troll people on the internet. So I do think that's another sort of form of, of the same thing, really. Yeah, it's so important when you think about, I know sometimes we try to talk particularly about forensic psychology, but actually all of these theories that are, are out there in the world of psychology, it's really about applying them in a forensic way, I guess. Um, and there's so many crossovers. If you, you know, as soon as we started talking about rights, you think, oh, in prison, how does that work? Or there was just so many crossovers. And, and, and another one I thought about was this idea of being radicalised. You know, would, would people that go out and have a real clear vision about where they wanted that right to go you know perhaps it starts in social media and they gather a bit of speed of it you know and then all of your thinking is about that particular cause or aim or whatever it is you're trying to change 
you know, I just wonder how that tips over into you know, the ideas of being radicalised or, you know, the idea of becoming part of the terrorist movement. I mean, they're, they're so close when you add those theories onto a particular behaviour that happens. And actually radicalised has taken on a slightly different meaning generally in general use now, but it can be into any sort of... Um, from my understanding, radicalisation could be into anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be into terrorism. It's drawn into a sort of a group space, into a group way of thinking. And once we're in that group, again, we feel that we'll lose status if we get, we're not part of that group. Um, and I guess some of the things that are happening now is that a person who's very influential is feeling that they're losing their status. And so maybe this is a response to that, um, which in group think would be, would be quite a frightening thing to happen. Because I think some of the older theories might be around, oh, well, somehow if violence starts and the rest of society are somehow going to, it's going to affect everyone and then everyone's going to become violent. And then actually it's only a certain group of people who might align with those certain identities. Um, so I think this identity has a massive role. And actually what we know about forensic psychology and the work by Shad Maruna is actually when people have non-offending identities, that acts as a bit of a protective factor towards not offending in the future. So I think there's lots of different parallels, but I think identity and the sense of belonging and when that is threatened actually how risky that can be the right mix of things that allow this these kind of situations to happen it's just a very dysfunctional way of people expressing perhaps their their social identity or their sense of belonging mm. when that group feels threatened yeah it's often a perfect storm of things isn't it if yes yeah. one of those ingredients wasn't there so i was thinking about social media and language and how language is so important and i guess there's a big shift in forensic psychology around how we um define or how we talk about the people that we work with so moving away from diagnostic models of working with people and moving away from categorizing people as offenders and non-offenders and um, and I think actually it is very very powerful the role that language plays it can stigmatize a lot of people but it can also it's very very powerful and I often think oh sometimes when I see things online I think oh god that's really really emotive and it, it does kind of draw you into certain ways of thinking perhaps and I think it takes a lot to try and challenge yourself to think critically about things but I think that's the power of the group isn't it is that it silences any sort of constructive criticism so I think that's perhaps some of the process similar processes that happens um is that actually there's a total denial of the out group and anything that threatens that in group just becomes totally intolerable so I hope you enjoyed our um, episode of let's talk friends in psychology today uh, and if there's things that you think you know you'd like to think about with us then by all means suggest them um, so we're on LinkedIn now and on um, Facebook and on all the social media Instagram and Twitter so do get in touch and thanks for watching <laughs>